you very much for the opportunity to be here today uh, to present the work of reefscapers and specifically our methodology for the use of coral larval settlement ex situ for upscaling restoration of declining aquifer species here in the Maldives. A little bit of a background on reefscapers. We've been involved in asexual propagation uh, within the Maldives for a little more than 20 years, um, pioneering the coral frame technique in a response to mass bleaching events. To date, uh, over half a million coral fragments have been deployed to the reef of over 40 different species. That's obviously led to a large collection of coral frames. Um, and because of that, we've employed a very stringent monitoring practice whereby we take photographs of our frames every six months. That huge pictorial database is then managed using artificial intelligence, which we've developed in-house using convolutional neural networks. Uh, that AI program is then used to uh, adapt our management strategies moving forward. In tandem with this, at the back end of last year, we decided to branch out into sexual reproduction, which led to the first collection in situ, and then fertilization and settlement ex situ. So the reason behind this was to try and fill in a data gap. Not a huge amount is known about spawning patterns within the Maldives, and we could find no previous record of ex situ settlement uh, achieved with Acropora, again, within the Maldives. Obviously, for us, our methodology is very successful. Um, asexual reproduction is widely employed, but it does have its drawbacks. Without efficient management, uh, this can lead to uh, issues such as genetic bottlenecks, and obviously, sexual spawning is a way to combat that. For us as well, we wanted to produce a methodology that could be widely distributed throughout the Maldives. Um, sharing with local stakeholders, local communities to enhance restoration uh, here in the country. Obviously, tracking spawning will give us a greater level of understanding, and we hope that that greater level of understanding will give us the ability to assess population recovery following any future disturbances. So how do we go about this? Essentially, we're looking for the presence of gametes. White gametes would indicate immature, and pigmented would indicate mature. And those mature gametes is really then the cue for us that a spawning event is likely to happen in the near future. We generally find the presence of these gametes when we are sampling for our asexual methodology by breaking small pieces of the coral and looking inside the skeleton. And then once we find the pigmented gametes, we're using environmental cues such as lunar cycle, uh, full or new moon, tidal charts, wind, and then sea surface temperature to predict that spawning event. This is not an exact science at the moment, and I say predict because then the hard work begins. We jump in the water in the days leading up to these predicted events, and if we're not quite correct, the days afterwards as well. And then we're looking for the immediate cue from the coral colonies themselves. And you can see in the small circular photo there, we have bundling. And that's the presence of the gametes in the mouths of the polyps of the coral, and that then says to us that spawning is about to happen. Because we wanted to collect, um, we had to design a methodology to collect these gametes once they're released from the corals. So we settled upon a conical shaped device made from plankton mesh with aquarium bulkheads, um, some substrate attachment, and then collection bottles and flotation devices above. We placed these coral collection devices over multiple colonies of the same species to increase uh, genetic diversity and obviously fertilization success and the magic number we were looking for was three or more. As you can see from the bottom left picture there, the gametes are positively buoyant when they're released. So they're released from the colony, they float up through the collection device into our collection bottle on the top, which we can then remove from the net itself, cap, and then take out of the water. Uh, it's important to remember that if no spawning is observed, we will remove these collection devices, and then we can redeploy them the following night, obviously to prevent any damage to the coral colonies themselves. Because we wanted to fertilize, once the gametes are taken out of the water, we will switch them over to some pre-prepared buckets of fresh salt water. This is to start the disassociation process, essentially the splitting of the sperm and the egg, and that would take around 30 minutes. And during that 30 minute period, we would agitate that bucket of water two or three times, again, to split that egg and sperm, and obviously to start the fertilization process. Once that 30 minutes is up, we would look to take the eggs 
out of the buckets and transfer them through to our specially designed uh, open flow aquariums. Very important at this point, uh, two things. One is that we take a small subsample so that we can assess fertilization later. And secondly, we want to take as many eggs as possible, but as little sperm as possible. As you can see from the bottom left photograph there, that was one of the events we had uh, limited success with, let's say, before we perfected our methodology. Um, the water quality there is very poor, there's far too much sperm, and that then led, obviously, to increased mortality. In the bottom right, you can see a uh, greater level of success. We've perfected our filtration. Um, the water quality is extremely good, and obviously, survivorship is very high. That small subsample that we've taken is obviously then going to be used to assess fertilization through uh, embryogenesis, and embryogenesis is the next step. It is important as well to remember, um, once you transfer the eggs through to the aquarium, to leave them be. That's why we take that small subsample. While they're going through cellular division, we don't want to uh, influence them in any way. So here we have some embryogenesis, and this is uh, photographs taken from those subsamples. Um, and the first cellular division there, or the two blastomere, the second photo in, is the uh, way that we would look for fertilization success within that subsample. Essentially, we're looking for around 90% of that sample showing this level of division to indicate to us that we've had a successful fertilization event. You can see uh, some other stages of uh, division there as well. You have your four blastomere, eight blastomere, and on the next slide, it will continue as well. Embryogenesis for us, obviously species de uh, dependent, would take anywhere from 60 to 90 hours. Um, We've recorded this several times over several different species, and this, of course, then allows us to predict more accurately um, the timings of each division and, of course, any species-specific differences as well. As we said, the continuation, so here you have 16, um, you have prawn chip, the bowl stage, and then the round stage as well. And the round stage is the immediate precursor to planulate formation, and, of course, once you start seeing the round stage, then you can start preparing for, for planulate. One of the cues for us uh, that planulae were present was locomotion. So we were looking for planulae traveling from the surface of the aquariums down towards the bottom. Uh, and it was at this point we would choose to introduce our preconditioned settlement substrate. So we would precondition our substrate using open flow uh, aquaria, subjected to natural sunlight for around three weeks. Um, we gave the option of a variety of different substrates, uh, rock with CCA, glass, ceramic tiles and plastic tubes um, because up until this point we've really been perfecting our methodology um, we haven't looked too much into settlement substrate preference but this is something moving forward that we'll definitely start to subject uh, and, and trial more rigorously some basic results so to date we've settled five species of acropora over seven events and that was from october last year through to uh, present day uh, you can see the species that we've had success with there on the slide. Um, initial settlement was on mass. Uh, and from the pictures there, you can also see that we had settlements in very close proximity to each other. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but we are unsure at the moment if this is uh, a natural occurrence or if it's simply down to volume of water, volume of planulae, and amount of uh, substrate that's offered. Uh, that, again, is something that we'll work on going into the future. Because Obviously, we're opening, uh, operating sorry, on open flow systems. We do still uh, subject all of the water that runs through our aquarium to filtration. So it runs through sand filters and then filter stocks. So to encourage uptake of Zuzanselli, we took fragments of the same species and put them into the aquarium uh, with our newly settled corals. Uh, and as you can see from the photographs there, that gave us good results. Obviously, the importance of this work uh, and the importance of this, establishing this methodology is to increase the amount of genetically diverse corals that we can outplant back onto the reef in tandem with any asexual work that's also going on. Um, we hope this will improve adaptive and evolutionary potential and obviously enable um, coral reefs to withstand any anthropogenic pressures that they may come under. The combination of asexual uh, and sexual settlements we hope will lead to an accelerated recovery of the natural reef, which will obviously lead then to a greater restoration success. Finally, moving forward, 
obviously now we've perfected our methodology. Um, we want to start to look into answering some of the outstanding questions that have been born from this study itself. Uh, the first two points that you can see there, assessing the survivorship of ex situ settlement versus in situ, uh, and uh, assessing methods for targeted planular dispersal on degraded areas of the reef, are two points that we're going to focus on with the spawning events coming up at the end of this year. Um, we also want to do some work on our ex situ settlement and exposing newly settled corals to a variety of different environmental stresses, uh, such as thermotolerance, and then garnering some results from that as well which we hope can uh, adjust methodology moving forward. As we already touched on, um, larval density and settlement and survivorship is also something we really want to look at. Um, if this close proximity settlement is a natural occurrence, we want to know about it. If it's not, we want to perfect the amount of planulae, the volume of water, and the amount of settlement to give us the most amount of success possible. And finally for us, um, it's all about collaboration. We're collecting a lot of information on spawning patterns within the Maldives, and of course, our work here uh, on sexual settlement, we want to be able to share that far and wide, uh, and it's our hope that this can be best used then to upscale restoration practices nationwide. Uh, 